All right, so Jen's starting on another one. She's gathered up her mass for the stem. And the process begins again, just as it did the last time. If you're just tuning in on the internet, this is Jen Violet, and we're working here in the amphitheater at the Corning Museum of Glass, so welcome and uh, thanks for tuning in. For those of you here in the amphitheater, thanks for being here. If you have any questions, uh, let us know. And uh, we're here with Jen Violet. She is working on a fern leaf, like the ones here on this bench. So we worked on a few of these yesterday and the day before, and uh, now we're starting on another one, a large one. Last one we did uh, split into the stem, so we're starting over. And that's, uh, that's kind of the way it goes with glass. I feel like it was a little bit my fault. I let that, I wasn't watching that back end. So uh, I apologize, Jen, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys, all those bits you ran. It was good practice for the next one, right? So this time uh, I, I have to be more careful about the back end. It's really a matter of uh, being scared. I was scared because everything was really wiggling around. And I have to let it stay in there that extra few seconds. Uh, so maybe, I don't know, I'll ask, maybe I'll ask Jen to put the torch on the moil a little bit too. So the moil is the glass that's wound around the end of the pipe. It's what holds on to the iron. So that ends up becoming uh, trash later on. It pops off the pipe it, uh, when it, it's discarded later. So that sometimes, because it's right up against the iron, the iron, the metal, the steel that the, the pipes are made out of is a real uh, good heat sink. It sucks the heat out of the glass. So a lot of times the glass around that metal will split and sometimes that split will run into the glass that you're working on and that's exactly what happened here. So um, you have to make sure there's a little bit of color in that iron and you want, you're looking for just a little cherry red glow in that metal. If it looks completely black and if the glass on the end of it looks like it's ice, like a very white color, then you know it's time to get some heat in there. Ah. Oh, a toddler on the internet is, is wondering, has a question. We don't take questions from toddlers, I'm sorry. Oh, we do, okay. Okay, we do today, I'm just kidding. All right, Jen, there is a toddler on the internet who would like to know what your favorite thing to make is yeah. Yeah. Sheep. Ferns. She likes it all. She doesn't have one favorite thing. Clearly, it's kind of the thing she's got her finger, you know, under her fingers at the time. So uh, right now, it's the fern. And the last thing she made yesterday was a sheep, so she said sheep, so um, she likes making uh, things from nature. We could say that. Those are her favorite things to make. So you see a lot of vegetables. You know, there's a radish sitting there. There's an apple. She has seedlings under little um, bobesh. So things, you know, when you think of the garden, when you think of a little farm, which is where Jen lives. You know, she's inspired by the things that she's surrounded by, and she's surrounded by a beautiful little farm, and she's got little children, so you see little hands discovering little balls or little vegetables or things that you find around the garden. So those are the things that Jen's inspired by. She likes making things she sees every day.
great questions coming in. That's a good question for a toddler, I think. Okay, so we've got, we're back to square one. We have the stem made. Uh, Jen has pulled that to the length that she wants. Can I remove the, uh, the calipers from the bench at this point? So they are out of your way. So the calipers are a great tool when you have something make and you're making it in glass, it's really good not to have to hold the piece of glass up to a piece of paper to measure it, because a lot of times the paper catches on fire. So we use calipers to measure things with the glass. And usually they're made out of steel, some type of metal. So it looks like Chris has the first bit prepared. Uh, Jen's getting the stem all set. She's using her fancy expensive jacks to cut a neckline. And here comes the first bit. So you can see Jen is, is sure, she's making sure that um, the piece is still moving when she's putting that bit on. That ensures that you have a good seal. You have a hot glass to a hot glass seal. If you have a cold piece of glass and you put a hot piece of glass on it, sometimes it won't even stick. It has to be a hot to hot seal. Here goes the next. Oh, am I? I'm sorry. Sorry, Jen. looks cold to me. I Yeah, I'll, I'll torch it while I'm sitting there waiting. Okay. And then when I go into flash there, you know, the leaves just start moving. You want to flash? Yeah, I'm going to flash. We have to avoid those cold seals. So we got to make sure that our timing is right and I have the right heat on this for when that bit comes over. All right, so Megan's on the next bit here. Hey, welcome to those of you just joining us here in the amphitheater. We're here at the Corning Museum of Glasses uh, Hot Glass Amphitheater, which used to be the Stuben Glassworks here since 1951. 
And we've got Jen Violet with us today. Can we put a little torch on that moil for a little bit? So I think I was saying before that the glass is colored with uh, crushed up uh, pulverized glass that's colored with iron oxide. That's where you get the green and maybe some potassium dichromate. It's a really bright green. Looks very alive. And here we have Chris Rochelle bring a bit. So Chris and Megan are alternating. They're each bringing two leaves over to Jennifer, and she uh, flattens them out with the crimps. And you get a nice symmetrical fern shape. And we want to avoid what happened last time, so Jen uses that fluffy torch there to put heat back into the iron so that that moil doesn't crack. So I was just talking to Jen, and uh, I was telling her I was afraid when it was wiggling around like that. So I, I let it get a little too cold, and now I'm afraid that it's going to get too cold, so I'm letting it wiggle a little too much. So I'm overcompensating. <laughs> but we're saying, yeah, it's better to have distortion than cracking, because you, you can always push it back into shape. So I get the piece when I'm heating it, I get it just to the point where the freshest leaf starts bending over, and then I have to get out of there before it gets too hot and touches back on itself. So it starts really waving, and if you watch in the, um, in the furnace, when they have the camera on, the furnace cam on, you can see how that one last leaf that she just put on starts to wiggle around, and that's how I know, oh, I better get out of there.
Let's see how this one wiggles, Jen. A real skinny form like this, dissip it really dissipates the heat quickly. So you have to get it pretty hot so that the, the bits will stick on without cracking the piece because it loses that heat really quickly. So you can see now that the leaf is on, some time has passed and everything's moving really slow now. It's, it's stiffening up, which means it's getting brittle. So when Jen gets that back from the furnace, she kind of taps it in just the right spot to keep the stem straight and to put the, everything back in alignment as best as she can. She sort of gets it to the point and she's looking for the right speed at which it's falling to know when she should put the next leaf on there. If it's falling too fast, she won't have control enough to form it how she wants to. You need to have sharp shears for this, don't you, Jen? She's too focused to answer. Hey, welcome to those of you just joining us here. You're at the amphitheater at the Corning Museum of Glass. And uh, we've got a visiting artist here today by the name of Jen Violet from Vermont. And she's sharing her talents with us today. Right now she's making a fern. And she's about halfway up this stem putting leaves onto this fern.
So this process is uh, essentially we're keeping this piece hot. We're trying to keep it uh, around 1500 Fahrenheit or over. And then Jen is building the leaves up the stem here, one at a time. And they're made out of bits that are brought by Megan Matthey and Chris Rochelle. So they've, they're gathering up some glass, coloring it with powdered glass to make it green. And then Jen is applying it to the stem. All right, looks like we got a question. Yeah. What's that? Say it. Okay. All right. So uh, we got a couple questions. The first of which was tips for people who are just uh, starting with glass blowing, how to get better. Well, practice makes perfect. I think that would be the best tip you could get. The more time you get at the furnace uh, with uh, good instruction, the better. You have to make sure you're working pe with people who know what they're doing, though, and learning from people who know what they're doing. That's another tip. Make sure the people who are make, or you're working with are making the things you want to make the way you want to make them. Uh, so yeah, those are a couple tips. You know, get in there and, and make stuff. That's the best thing. Jen, do you have any tips for people just starting out as glass makers? Practice. Yeah. Yeah, Jen makes this look really, really easy, you know, sculpting each one of these individually and uh, making a beautiful object is not easy. And Jen has, she's told me she worked uh, at several production jobs uh, before she had her own studio making her own artwork. So, you know, the production, she was making lots of pieces every day of the week, you know, for some type of market, maybe tableware. So yeah, find a, maybe find a job where you can practice glass blowing, maybe doing production. It's a great way to get your hands on glass a lot. If you only do it once a week, it's hard to get better. But even so, if you uh, structure your time right, you can improve if you only do it once a week. It's just going to be slower than if you're doing it every day. Do you want me to talk about the furnace too? Or do you want me to answer what you're, you've got here? I can really only do one at a time. <laughs> so hang on a second. So the other question was about our furnaces. And uh, how do we replace them? How do we maintain them? We got a couple different types of furnaces here. Uh, we have invested pots where the crucible that holds the glass is cast right into the bottom of the furnace. And then we have a freestanding crucible furnace where the crucible, uh, crucible stands in the middle of the furnace. And the crucible can be replaced if it's cracked or wears out. So the invested furnace can last maybe up to 10 years and still produce OK glass. Whereas the, uh, the other, the, invest or the uh, freestanding crucible, you replace the crucible maybe once a year or depends on how much glass you're melting in there. Some people do it every 60 melts or so or every six months. Um, 
once a year, however you want to do it. Uh, so those are two different ways of maintaining and replacing furnaces. Uh, sometimes you rebuild the whole furnace, but typically you want to run a furnace like that, like this 1,000-pound furnace we have here is made by Fred Metz. It's a very specialized furnace. And that'll, we're hoping that lasts us uh, you know, eight years or so at least. But the, the glass is always uh, corroding away at the material that the furnace is made out of. Glass is one of the most corrosive substances when it's molten. So it'll eat through anything. So yeah, you do have to replace and maintain these furnaces. All right, so some of you have noticed how we're coloring the glass with glass powder. And we have a question from the internet. And uh, how do you make the glass powders? Well, the best way to make glass powders is have somebody make them for you. And that's how we make ours. Um, however, I know my boss, uh, who works here at the Corning Museum of Glass, used to work for a guy who made him pulverize ingots of glass into pow powders. So that's how it's made. You melt the glass, you have chunks or bars. And then it, you, you have some type of machine or something or a hammer and newspaper and you just crush it. You crush it. And then uh, the more you crush it, the finer the powder and you sift it through different screens. Great questions. Keep them coming, but pace yourselves. You're welcome. Does anybody here have any questions in the amphitheater? You have a question? Could you see what that question is real quick? Thanks, Mandy. Or you could come down. I'm kind of wrapped up. I'll be with you in just one second. What's your question? How do you know how, what, how much ingredients you need to make the different colors? Well, um, kind of like the frit or, and the powder, we actually don't make our own colors here. So we have this cart back here with all these color bars and crushed up colored frit. And we get them from a company in Germany who's been making glass color for 200 years. And that's how they know how much material to put into it, is because they've been doing it for 200 years and recording that process. And those guys are really good at making colored glass. Now, we can put a little color into our glass. If we put copper into some old glass, it'll make it kind of an aqua color. And that you just experiment with a little bit. So usually uh, you have a base glass that you're working with and you could put some metal oxides into it like iron. You could even throw nails into clear glass and it'll turn it green. So it does require some experimenting.
some gaffers bang their tools on the bench when they want that bit, but Jen is really polite. <laughs> I, I knew a guy who had a bell. He would ring the bell when he wanted a bit, like a little bell. Somebody who I used to work near with. Yeah. <laughs> Pavlov's dogs. I hope he's watching. I'm not going to name any names. All right, so Jeff Mack has taken a break from chit-chatting. My name's Meg, I'll be answering questions, so make sure you type them in online or let me know here in the amphitheater. I'll try and come around and answer things. We've got one right up here. So Chris is good for a minute running leaves. I'm happy to take a break, step away from the furnace. Yeah, what are you curious about? Come on down. We make these shows every day. We sure do. And it's a little bit different every day. So uh, Jen Violet is our guest glass blower here today, our guest artist. And she's from New or she's from Vermont. So a uh, visiting artist. And so some days we have other artists come through. So we're always making different types of artwork. When we don't have any special programming going on, every morning in the amphitheater is special because that means the team of artists here get to take turns working on our own special projects or uh, different ideas that the museum wants us to put together. And then we do different demonstrations for our visitors every single afternoon. So it's always something different, but always something special. Good question. Is there anything you're curious, uh, anything else you're curious about? Yeah. Yeah, great question was, you know, can you blow glass by yourself? Do you always have to have a team working together? And you certainly can work on your own. I think Jen, when she's at home at her studio, she works on a smaller scale and she does make these by herself. But I think you're pretty limited in terms of the scale and the complexity that you can bring to your artwork when you're not working with a team. So, um, you know, for working alone, there's modifications we can make to our studio. There are things like pipe hangers that we can use to hang a pipe vertically so that it doesn't fall off center with gravity. Um, there's hoses that you can attach to your blow pipes. If you're making a blown vessel or object, you can inflate it yourself while you're simultaneously you know, tooling the glass. So it can be done, but maybe not done as well or as epically as when you have a great big team there to help you and support you. Good question. So we had another question of, about how many uh, pounds of glass do we go through every week? And the melting furnace that we have here in the amphitheater holds 1,000 pounds of glass when it's full, which looks like about nine cubic feet. And so we don't ever empty out that entire furnace and then reload it all with new glass, or at least we do that incredibly infrequently. We like to top it off so that it's always easy to gather from. And so maybe two or three times a week, we'll top it off, and that can be anywhere uh, between 150 to 300 pounds at a time, you know, depending on how much glass we've been using, uh, what the scale of the objects we've been making in here. You know, uh, this type of project doesn't take much glass at all, but sometimes we cast glass, where we have you know, solid glass sculptures that can really take up a lot more material. But we buy our glass uh, from a manufacturer. And so, you know, soda lime glass is what we use up here. The main ingredient is silica. Soda ash is added to lower the melting temperature, and lime is added to stabilize that. 
And in its raw ingredients, that's a very dusty, powdery mixture. It looks a lot like talcum powder. And one of the dangers of being a glass blower would be to accidentally inhale glass dust. We don't want to do that. And so one of the great things is that we can buy glass that's already been through that initial meltdown. So when they sell it to us, we get it in 50 pound bags of what look like little glass ice cubes. And so call that call it or nuggets. We can load them into a metal pail and or a shovel and then dump those into our furnace. So we do that every couple days. All right, now we're approaching the tip of our fern. Chris, do you want me to jump in and run any more bits? I love watching experienced gaffers like Jeff and uh, Jen and Chris all work together. And watching the way that that fern has to be turned as it kind of fights against gravity is pretty exciting. You know, it's really a dance that you're doing with that uh, soft piece of glass. And it's not that dissimilar from a you know, spaghetti noodle. You know, if, it, if you really overheat it, it will just flop and wiggle and fall out of control. But it's that fine line, because if it gets just a little bit too cold, it's so vulnerable that it's going to crack and break. Did Jeff talk about that at all, about how the glass might crack if it cools down too much? A little bit, yeah. Well, again, if you're curious about anything, just uh, flag me down. I'll come around and I can answer questions. Sorry, it's hard to hear you over the torches. Let me get close. Well, yeah, so you said it looks like it's changing states, and you're talking about states of matter, right? It looks like it goes from a liquid to a solid, and it, it does um, have that pretty amazing um, working range and the consistency change. We describe it as the viscosity, the consistency of the glass. You know, some people want to describe it as elastic, but glass is not elastic because it never springs back. But it is a, a pretty unique state of matter. You know, when you think about things that are liquids, the molecules in a liquid are uh, dispersed in the uh, kind of in a, a floaty, irregular pattern. And then normally, or often most materials, as they cool to a liquid, all those molecules line up into a crystalline structure. So they just kind of align themselves and fit together like little bricks. And glass, when it cools down, it never makes that crystalline structure. The molecules are still like that as a solid, or uh, sorry, like that of a liquid. And so that's why it's really unique. gives you this kind of amazing range to play with it and manipulate it. Yeah, good question, good observation. So one thing I'm impressed with um, watching Jen sculpt this fern is how even as she changes the scale of each leaf, you know, the shape is really consistent. And that's hard to do because um, you know, the more glass you take, you know, thinking about the bigger leaves, she's taking a bigger bit of glass every time, it has more thermal mass. You know, so the more glass you have right there, the longer it's going to retain its heat. And so that really gives her some time and some play to be able to squish the leaf and to stretch it the perfect amount, give it that profile. Now those smaller bits of glass, the little tiny leaves, you know, as soon as she starts to flatten those with the tool, they lose a lot of that heat and they don't have the thermal mass to recover as well. And so her movements have to be so precise pretty unforgiving uh, material that, you know, if you kind of fumble with something and you decide, ooh, I want to go back and change that or tweak that, it's really not going to give you a consistent result because you've changed the temperature of the glass and changed how it's going to respond to you. Another thing I'm really impressed with time after time is the way that she cuts the exact amount free from the feeder bit, the bit that Chris or I were uh, bringing to her. And that's just something that she's eyeballing. You know, there's no secret measurement attached to the shears. There's no, you know, alarm that is going to signal <laughs> that tells you you're about to cut too much glass free. So it really comes down to uh, practice that you can, you know, see how big of an attachment point you're making, how much you're stretching it. 
and then when you're cutting it, how much material you're actually going to keep. And she has a really good eye for it. Yeah, so Jeff was mentioning that glass, uh, molten glass is incredibly corrosive. And uh, you know, I don't know a lot about the, the chemistry and what's going on that makes it that way, but I have seen these crucibles, the pots, after you know, we empty out all the glass after it's cooled down and we see what's left after you've had glass melting inside this pot. And you know, the outside will look like a terracotta pot. You know, it has that very smooth, beautiful, perfect texture. And the inside looks like Swiss cheese, that the glass just eats down into it. It's pretty incredible. And so it's very easy to see how if you let it go, if you did not replace your crucible periodically, eventually your glass would eat all the way through it. Uh, I'm not sure the exact makeup. Jeff might be able to answer that a little bit better, uh, but it's like a high refractory uh, ceramic brick, but I think it's cast, yeah, so. Yeah, definitely. And if you're just joining us here in the amphitheater, our guest artist is Jen Violet. And she's been visiting all week long here at the Corning Museum of Glass, making beautiful sculptures. And many of them are inspired by nature. She lives on a farm in Vermont and has two little children. And so we've got some really beautiful objects up here that are kind of about you know, making discoveries in nature, little hands holding uh, small plants. we made different sheep and rabbits and watering cans and seedlings and a series of these big, beautiful ferns. Now, the way that she displays these work is often uh, in a wall-mounted shadow box. And so they're mixed media works of art. like just a few more leaves to go. So she's being really attentive to the glass backwards attached to the iron that as the glass goes in and out of the reheating furnace, that's the last section to go in, it's the first section to come out. And so all on its own, that area wants to be colder than the rest of the object. And if you were here at the very beginning, we uh, you know, got about halfway done with the fern and then it cracked close to the, the steel. And so we started again, you know. But this time we're really taking additional heats, making sure that that stays above the breaking point. got two different torches to help us out. She switched to a smaller torch, but this one burns quite a bit hotter. It's about 3,000 degrees. It looks like she's just giving it a bit of a haircut, trimming it a little shorter. So it's really helpful to be able to go in with that you know, high intensity torch and really selectively heat the tip of the fern. And if we tried to achieve that same amount of heat inside the reheating furnace, we'd be doing damage to the leaves that are adjacent to that area. 
know, Jeff has this job of making sure it all stays hot enough. But as soon as it starts to dance and wiggle around, he's so close to getting it too hot, you know, making it so floppy that those leaves might stick together. Every time we bring those bits of glass and present them to her, she sticks it down and then stretches it a little bit. But think about the way that Chris is holding the iron. You know, that glass is still very soft and it's still continuing to fall down toward the fern. And so as soon as it's cut free, you really have to be careful in the way that you move the glass away. You don't want that excess glass to uh, tag or stick back down to any place. And as the leaves get smaller and smaller, the ratio of glass that gets left behind on the sculpture and the glass that's uh, still on the steel keeps changing and becoming trickier. We've got some more folks just joining us here in the amphitheater. Welcome. And this week we have a guest artist, Jen Violet, visiting us from Vermont. So we've got the team here, Jeff Mack, Chris Rochelle. My name is Megan Matthew. I'll help him out to create this beautiful fern sculpture. Now the color of this fern is the same as the colors that we're looking at over here, these beautiful, bright, kind of yellow greens, spring greens. But of course, the whole time we're working with them today, they're well above 1,000 degrees and they're glowing. They're so hot. And so when you think about an orange glow mixing with a bright green color, you land somewhere in the ugly brown range. So it won't be until tomorrow when this glass reaches room temperature for the first time that we'll get to open up the oven and see it with its true colors. But if you look at the tray uh, right in front of the bench there, you can see some of the little bits of glass that she knocked off the tip of the stem. You can see that true color there in the scrap pile. And people wonder what we do with all the scrap glass. They wonder if we can remelt it and reuse it. But if it has color applied to it, if it's fallen on the floor, if it's got any impurities or dirt, we don't want to reuse it ourselves. You know, inside our melting furnace, we have beautiful, pristine, perfect, clear molten glass. And if we started adding our scraps, all the other colors would mix in. Some people think that would turn it into a beautiful rainbow soup of glass that you could make rainbow glass with. No, it just looks ugly. So we uh, do recycle the glass, but not ourselves. It's going to go to a recycle plant, a recycling plant. Um, often it'll become an aggregate in asphalts and concrete. But if we do make something out of clear glass that just doesn't uh, match our standard or isn't what we were hoping for, we can always remelt that clear glass as long as it's nice and clean. All right, I'm gonna guess that we've got one leaf to go, and this will be on the very tip of our fern. So as these sculptures get taller and taller as she's, or as she's working closer and closer toward the end, I always think about the wingspan of the gaffer and the reach that you have to have to carefully that glass because she's still controlling the rotation with her left hand but her left hand has to be so far away on that pipe because of the heat in the pipe so it's always a big stretch but beautiful job so all the leaves are applied but if we look at the work that she completed earlier this week, you can see that each of the ferns has this really beautiful, elegant curl to it, a little bit of a curve. And so we're not done yet. I think we're still going to see her kind of finesse the shape and finalize the design. 
some people might wonder, well, why not make the stem curved and then apply all of the leaves? But it's much easier to maintain uh, as much symmetry as possible for as long as possible. You know, once you break that radial symmetry or once you, you know, give something a curve, you pull it off in one direction or another, you know, every time you get it in that hot oven, you know, and, and start to turn it, centrifugal force is going to want to exaggerate that asymmetry. It's going to want to exaggerate that curve. And so if you can keep it nice and straight up until the point where you want to do a controlled manipulation of the, the shape and the contour, you're going to do a lot better. like we're going to add some more color to it as well. So you know, every time we brought over a bit with the leaves, we had already applied some of the green powdered glass to it. But that was melted in and then brought at such a high temperature that the surface became very uh, shiny and glassy again. But I think Jen's intention now is to add a little bit more of the powdered glass, and this time not heat it to the point that it completely melts in. You know, we don't want it to become molten. It's going to leave a little bit of a texture behind. And so I think it's um, a really uh, fascinating element to her work. As you look at some of the other examples of things that she's created, you can see that the apple skin doesn't look like glass. It looks like apple skin. You can see that the sheep look fluffy. You know, the dirt looks like dirt. It's because she's using those different glass powders. She's using sandblasting techniques, you know, different ways to uh, change the texture of glass. I mentioned how you know when we charge the furnace or when we add more clear glass to our melting furnace, uh, the raw ingredients are very dusty. They're very hazardous. The same goes when we use uh, colored glass powders. And so that's why we have a special ventilation booth over here. This kind of black box has got a fan attached to it. And so as, as we roll our bits of glass through those trays, or even if we were to sift glass, uh, colored glass over top of our sculpture like we're about to with the fern, that cloud of glass doesn't get inhaled by the glass makers. It gets sucked back into the ventilation system here. So she makes these very uh, kind of gentle adjustments to the individual leaves. She's letting it fall off center and then back on center. She's touching it. But something to be conscientious about as well is that the uh, crimps that she's using, those metal tongs, they're a heat sink. You know, they're going to very quickly cool the glass anywhere that you touch it. And so you want to do that sparingly because if you make, you know, if you if you hold on too long with a cold tool, that could actually crack the glass. So. It's important that she's using the same tool again and again that it actually builds up some heat. But not super cooling any one area. All right, so good heat from Jeff. Look at the movement of that glass, so beautiful. But just sifting that color. 
So she has two different greens that she's working with, and an uh, easy way to make green glass is to add iron oxide or rust to your material. And fluorine will make the glass turn opaque. So it's probably some kind of combination there. And very luckily for me, I went to art school. I got an art degree. I did not get a chemistry degree. And so there are manufacturers who sell us all of our colors. They do all of the careful uh, recipe making and color manufacturing. You know, they, they deal with the metals when they're in their most dangerous form. And they're also going to make sure that all of our colors are compatible with one another and compatible with our clear glass, which is pretty important. There's something called the coefficient of expansion, or the COE, and that describes the way that things expand and contract as they heat up and cool down. And with glass, it's very important that everything has a matching coefficient of expansion. So we're adding a couple layers of the glass powder at this point. And these flashes of heat that Jeff is taking, uh, you know, he really doesn't want to get it too hot. He really does not want to see that color texture go away, but he just needs enough heat that it's going to truly fuse onto the surface. So you might be able to see that the sheen is already changing. It's not quite as reflective with that powder on the surface. So it's tricky with a shape like this, trying to get an even distribution of that texture on the face of the leaves, on the ends of the leaves, on the stem and the negative spaces between the leaves. So just doing that careful rotation and application of powder. I love this little tool that she has in her right hand. That's a paddle made of cork. So there's two types of glass blowers: those who love the smell of burning cork and those who really dislike it. But it makes me think about a campfire. I think it's a really awesome smell. And you know, when we reach for these wooden tools, cork tools, people get surprised and they think we're a little confused that we would make that decision to reach for a wooden tool and hold it against glass that's over a thousand degrees. But it works because it's very gentle. You know, if we do the same kind of uh, manipulations with a metal tool or a graphite tool, those are such dramatic heat sinks that they will freeze up the glass before you get much shaping done. You know, the wood really gives you some time to play with it, push the glass around without cooling it down. So right before she goes to touch this fern. You might have noticed she held the tips of her tweezers in the torch flame. So again, because she was picking up a different tool that wasn't already warm, she made sure to preheat it. You know, we do not want to touch this sculpture with cold tools at this point. As we approach the finish line, people want to know, you know, when can we come and, and look at this object? Can I get a selfie with it today? But it's, at the point that we finish, it's going to be right around 1,000 degrees, between 900 and 1,000 degrees. And if we let it cool down in this ambient temperature, the thick parts would be cooling and shrinking faster, or sorry, more slowly than the thin parts. You know, the skin on the glass, the very outside layer, would be uh, constricting. The inside would still be really warm. So what we have to do in order to keep it from breaking itself apart is to put it into an annealing oven where it'll cool down slowly overnight. So we had a great question about how uh, 
all these camera angles are coming together, who's in charge, who's making those decisions. And we're really lucky in the amphitheater here that we have a great team of AV technicians. And so we actually have a live crew running the show, managing all those images for us. So it looks like Jen is finessing the shape and really trying to settle on the, the final contour for that beautiful fern. And another common question we get all the time is, what happens if you're unsatisfied with something? Can, or if something, you know, maybe one of the leaves were to break off, what, what are your options at that point? Can you heat it back up? Can you rework it? Can you edit things and change things? And for the most part, the answer is no. It's much more efficient to start from scratch, to make a brand new fern than to try and uh, rework something after it's been cooled down. So I know this really is our, our last chance. So we do have our guest artist, Jen Violet, working in the amphitheater until 4 o'clock today. But if you haven't seen live glass blowing before and want to see a demonstration from start to finish in a shorter amount of time, we've got a team in the Innovation Hot Shop. They've got demonstrations about every 40 minutes up there, starting every four minute, 40 minutes, I should say. So that's a really great way to uh, get a good taste of this process and see some more traditional blown glass shapes. So we had another great question about the ferns. And you can see some of the finished ones that were made earlier this week. And the question was, are they all going to be joined together uh, in some kind of combination? And the answer is no. She makes these individually. And the way that she uh, installs them in her artwork is kind of in these uh, beautiful shadow boxes. They end up uh, being wall-mounted works of art. And they're mixed media that she incorporates other materials and these really kind of beautiful vignettes. the fracks is on this side. So Jeff is getting his big Kevlar mittens on. It looks like we're approaching the finish line. So we just want to make sure we're all squared away to safely load it into our oven. You know, on the floor of these ovens, we've got some shelves. And if we have an object like this, we want to set it, set it down on something a little bit more gentle. And so there's a type of uh, blanket that's called fracks. I think of it as like a glass duvet, but it's nice soft, fluffy surface that we can set the fern on inside the oven. So it's going to be a precarious moment coming up because we do want to break the fern free from the uh, iron that it's attached to. And if you've broken glass at home, it probably didn't go very well. You know, glass tends to break on big, wild curves. And so we take some very careful measures to tell the glass exactly where we want it to break. So one of the ways that we can control it is by making a score mark. And what Jen has done down close to the iron, right in between the, the bottom of the stem here, is she made a constriction line. She started to uh, 
kind of partition the glass away. And I always think about a chocolate bar, how you have the lines in your chocolate bar that help you snap it apart. Well, if we have a line in our glass, we can break it. But another way that glass wants to break is wherever it's the coldest, thermal shock helps break our glass. When I'm thinking about thermal shock, I always think about pouring room temperature soda over ice cubes. You know how the ice cubes will crack from the sudden change? Well, glass does that too, just at the other end of the spectrum. And so we can always think that the glass is most likely to break wherever the temperature is the highest, or I'm sorry, the temperature is the coldest and that uh, diameter is the smallest. So Jeff has been warming up his mittens. You might have seen him holding those in the torch. But we don't want to grab onto this with room temperature gloves, so. It looks like we might be cutting this glass free from this steel. So getting it really hot, trying to get that consistency nice and soft. Which will go in with the shears. All right, so hopefully that glass is spongy enough that she can really bite down through it. Beautiful. Right into the oven it goes. Let's have a great big round of applause for our guest artist, Jen Violet. Awesome team, good help from Chris Rochelle and Jeff Mack. Beautiful. All right, so we're gonna take a...